to tell Jesus. Tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress. verse 4 there. Verse 4, man, that's powerful. You know why? He's talking about sanctification. Come on, listen to me this morning. Verse 4, oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart, listen, listen to this, is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. Can I tell you the good news this morning? You don't have to sin. He gives you the victory. He gives you the strength and the power. You don't have to live a defeated life. That's what it's saying right here. You know how you do it? You call out to Jesus. And he takes care of it. Let's sing that last verse just one more time. Verse 4.
turn the page over, 625. What a friend we have in Jesus.
All right. Now, this song here, we're going to have a little fun with. This This is kind of a little fun song. Everybody will know it. You can sing with us, and you can participate. Because I just looked it up in my Bible to make sure I was right. Psalm 47, verse 1, says, Clap your hands, all ye people. So this is going to be a good opportunity for you to clap your hands and have some fun with a good old song. And uh, just join in and just help us, all right? How many of you remember when we had Jeff Stice here? You remember when Jeff Stice was here, the piano player? You remember that? He's playing on this. You'll hear him play a little bit during this, and he, he does a fantastic job. So just, you'll know the song. All right. Let's, let's crank her up and go, boys. <laughs> I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, I'll Fly away, come on now. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. Come on now, just enjoy yourself a little bit. You've, you've made the effort to get here. You might as well have a good time. Amen. Now, I told you Jeff was going to pick a little bit. It's coming up right here in just a second. You ready? Here you go, a little piano, David. Just a few more weary days and then I fly away to a home where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. Y'all ready to really go, right? That's what he's saying. Y'all ready to take off now? <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. If you'll stand, we'll be dismissed. We... No, 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 not yet. Not yet, not yet. So, oh, me. Well, the first and not the children will be in with us this morning. And so, if you would, turn to Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, considered one of the minor prophets, not because it's not important, just it's smaller. So Amos chapter 5, just a few verses this morning. If you would, stand with me after you have found it. And we'll begin reading in verse 4. So Amos chapter 5, verse 4, and the Bible says this, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. And that's pretty good, right? Man, good words of advice. Verse 5, But do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal, or cross over to Beersheba. 
For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Verse 6 says this at the beginning. Seek the Lord and live. Lord Jesus, I pray would you just continue to touch us today. Lord, we are so thankful that, Lord Jesus, we seek you. We're able to live because one day you're going to call us away. But, Lord, on that day, it's not going to be a sad day. It's going to be a day truly that we just heard sung about. But we're flying away to glory. What a wonderful day that will be. So I pray, dear Heavenly Father, you just continue to be with us right now. Your spirit will continue to flow through this place. And may, Lord, we be excited about what your word says. And may we let it speak to us. Lord Jesus, have your way this morning. That the spirit flows through this place. And we, once again, are just obedient people to what the spirit is speaking to us. Lord, would you touch me now? Move me out of the way. Lord, that only you are seen, that you are heard, and I pray that you bless us right now. We ask all these things in the most precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. You may be seated. (laughs) Today we live in a society that is based on gimmicks. Gimmicks is what turns the world sometimes. Gimmicks with the ideas of our TVs, of our radios, from mail to your phone. I don't know if you've ever pulled out your phone, but I guarantee you if you've got uh, the thing they call a smartphone, that you probably have received a gimmick through your phone. They are trying to get you to buy into something, to look at something, to do something, and it's all based on a gimmick that they have. Gimmicks could be found in any store about that you walk into. There is something that is vying to get your attention. Uh, The definition, though, of gimmick, to actually think about this word, it truly has two different meanings. The first meaning of the word gimmick is this. It means a trick or device intended to attract attention, publicity, or business. So we all know about those gimmicks, man. They are trying to get us in and all these different aspects. But can I tell you also about the other definition about gimmick? It's this. It means a concealed, usually devious aspect or feature of something as a plan or a deal. Now, that sort of gimmick is what we need to talk about this morning because that's what happens in the churches sometimes. Gimmicks begin to be put on display. Gimmicks begin to be used, and I'm afraid that in the society that we live in, uh, sometimes a lot of churches begin to rely upon gimmicks more than they rely upon anything else. What can we truly do to be able to get people to church? So I've heard anything from, I'll stand on the rooftops and preach, If a certain amount of people come, or I'll do something else crazy if a certain amount of people come, when truly the Word of God is very specific in how to get people to church. If we lift up the name of Jesus, He says that He'll draw all people in. It it all comes down to, what are we willing to do? You see, sometimes if a crowd gets down, all of a sudden we just slump down in our seat. And we just don't, we're having to get something and we're using somebody else's cane just to prop us up because we didn't need it walking in. And sometimes we look around and we think, man, what in the world is going on? And we're saying, man, what can we do to get more people in? The aspect of it is this. Don't allow Satan to try to move in to try to figure out a gimmick to try to get people to church. We don't need gimmicks. We just need to be the church. And in today's society, a lot of times these gimmicks... Or what begins to happen. A lot of times gimmicks are used to try to get your money. Gimmicks are used to try to get a number that can be put on the board. Gimmicks are used in a lot of different aspects. A a lot of different aspects. But you see we don't need churches that just want our money or our numbers. uh, But ones that are truly serious about eternity. And living a life that God has called us out to. Listen to me. The word of God is not always going to be popular. But it is the word of God. 
And so when we begin to take a step backwards and we begin to rely on something else other than the Word of God, it becomes a gimmick. It becomes really a devious act to try to get people to church when really it's not based upon do we want to see people's lives change. You see, I hope this morning that you're here because you're saying this, I, I want to look more like Jesus. I I'm not coming because I had to sing. I'm not coming because I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm not coming. I'm coming because I really want to look more like Jesus. I believe that there is going to be something found in the Word of God that will be preached today, that will be sung today, that will be shared today, that is going to help my life look more and more like His. It's not a gimmick. That's what the Word calls us to. The aspect of not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is not so that we can just have a good number. It's so that we can come together and God's spirit can be felt among his people and we encourage each other. And we pat each other on the back. And when people are having a hard time, we pray for them. And when someone's sick, we call them up and we lay hands on them. When all these different, that's the reason that we assemble together. Don't get it all confused with a gimmick of some sort. Of the reason that we are to come to church. Really we just need to be real. Because that's what the world is looking for. Because all the world sees every day is the first definition that I gave you. It's a gimmick. It is something just trying to get their attention or their money or their body into a place. When what the church is we need to be. Just be real. Just be who we are called out. By Jesus Christ. I, I want us to look this morning at a story and really how we can see how this can apply to our church today. In verse 4, the Bible tells us, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But here's the thing this morning that we truly need to see that just as true as this statement was when Amos spoke it, it is the same today. For uh, Listen, for the body of Christ, our whole aspect is to seek Him. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been in the church. The whole aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to seek Him to be able to live. Because without Him, you're dead. That there is no living. We have to seek out the one that is the giver of life. But the whole aspect of that is this. We need the people that are lost and dying to be able to see that we are seeking something other than the world. Sometimes I am afraid that they begin to look at us and they say, you're seeking the same thing that I'm seeking. You're not acting any different throughout the week than what I act. You just come to church and then act like that you're seeking the Lord. But I really don't see a difference in the way you live. You see, you have to be able to seek Him to live right. See, the whole aspect of this becomes to this point. You read this word, it will convict you. I don't care how old, I don't care how young, I don't care how long, I don't care anything else about your walk with the Lord. If you read this, it is convicting. Because number one, we're not in heaven yet. And so the aspect of it is this. He is saying, seek me and live. I want to draw you closer than you've ever been before to me. Jesus is speaking today, even saying the same thing. And in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, Jesus says this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find, knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone, listen, I love the aspect of this. Are, are you hearing this this morning? For everyone. There is no stipulation. There is no thing to say, no, no, you asked, but I can't give it to you. No, it says, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be Open. Today, Jesus is saying, seek me and live. I'm going to give it to you. I will give you life and life more abundantly. That's what I want you to have. In verse 5, Amos begins to speak the words that God has said. And man, sometimes I, I think about this as I, I read over it, reread over it, and as I've studied it. And he says this. 
Amos tells the people that God said, do not seek Bethel. Don't seek Bethel. Really? Don't seek Bethel? Why in the world? If Bethel in the Hebrew means the house of God. Why in the world would we not seek Bethel? Why would we not seek something that is the name, the title of the house of God? Don't seek him there, he says. But right, Bethel's a holy place. It's a holy place. That's the place that we need to be in Genesis chapter 12, verse 8. You remember Abraham built an altar to the Lord there. It was at Bethel. If you look at Genesis 28, 12, you remember that Jacob had a vision of the ladder and the angels coming up and down from heaven. Man, this is the place to be. It's Bethel, the house of God. And he's saying, don't go there. Don't seek that. Why in the world? Well, if you remember in 1 Kings chapter 12, in verses 26 through 33, we find a story. The story is of King Jeroboam, and he made two gold calves at the time, and he looked at the people, and he told the people that they have went to Jerusalem way too long to worship the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 12, and he set one of them up in Bethel and the other in Dan. But he goes on to say this. And this thing became a sin to the people. Why? Because they begin to look at something else more than they begin to look at God. And all of a sudden, the place of Bethel that represents the house of God was then turned into a place that God says, Nope, you don't need to be seeking that. Look at where it's at right now. That is not the place that I want you to be. God told them, don't go back to Bethel and try to seek me there. It is a defiled place. But then at Gilgal, they would do the very same thing. They would worship idols. They would serve first false gods. The Bible says that they polluted the land. He told them then to cross over to Beersheba. But man, Beersheba, man, that's a great place too. Beersheba's an amazing time in Genesis 21. The Bible says that Abraham had come to Beersheba and that he invoked the name of God in that place and God fell. Beersheba, what an awesome time! The place you want to be, God moving in the midst. We find in 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible tells us that Elijah flees from Jezebel. Guess where he flees to? Take a guess. Beersheba. He flees to Beersheba and the angel of the Lord comes. Man on the scene, all of a sudden God begins to move. He is given bread and water and he went 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb to the mount of God. Man, what an amazing time that God is doing. But God looks at them. Listen, God looks at them. They know the history of the places. And man, in the Jewish society there, it would have been passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down. And these names, listen, these names would have meant a lot. Can I ask you something this morning? Is there a name that you could say to your children that you could say the place and automatically they know what you're talking about? Come on. Right? You with me? You can name a place. You don't have to describe anything about it. And your children go, boom. I don't even have to say anything. You see, the aspect of it is this. A lot of times it has everything to deal with the world. And sometimes really nothing to do with God. Come on. Come on. Do your children and your grandchildren know the place you got saved? Can you take them to it? Can you explain to them what happened? Do they know the place you got sanctified? I don't care if it's in a house that you don't live there anymore. I'm not saying you go back there. Listen, I'm getting ready to get to that point. What I'm saying is this. Do they remember? Do they know about your conversion? 
Do they know about how God has transformed you? Do they see a difference in your life right now? Can they look at you and say, man, he's talking about that time. She's talking about that time. And man, I see the difference in a life that they're living out. Why? Because that was probably your Beersheba. It's probably your Gilgal. And you can think about that and go to those places. I, I can always take you back to the place I got saved at Summersville. They're having church there this morning. I can take you back to if you're standing like this, like you all are sitting. I can take you to the right-hand side. I can kneel you down right at the altar at the place. I know exactly where it's at. My children know exactly where it's at. I can take you to the place I got sanctified. Right now, all it is is just a pavilion. There's nothing going on there. I can take you to the spot where a big old trailer was pulled in and we had camp meeting. And I can take you down to, if you're looking at the place, I can take you down to the left-hand side of where I knelt down. And God entirely sanctified me and set me free. I can take, my children know about it because we drove past there before. And you know what I always, listen, I don't even have to say anything anymore. You know what they know? That's the place. That's the place. That's the place. Man, what do your children know about your life? Your transformation. What has Jesus done that your children will look back on you one day as you are laying in a casket and your life is done? And your children come by and look at you. What's all the good things they're going to be able to say? What's all the great times and places that they're going to be able to talk about that they went? Are they going to remember? Man, I remember the time they got saved. I remember when they got I was with Miss Pearl yesterday again. And I went up there and, and prayed with them. And I walked in and, and uh, Miss Pearl, the strokes had, had uh, really affected her pretty bad. As I went in, she was laying there, and she was unconscious. She hadn't been awake since, since uh, late Thursday night. And, and I walk in, and you know, you know what came into my mind? What came in, listen to me, church. What came into my mind, I did not walk into a room where death was drawing near. Mm -mm. No, you know what I did? I walked into a room where life was getting ready to happen forever. Uh, you see, as me and Lowell begin to talk about, and Kathy begin to talk about all the things that had happened in Pearl's life. The first time I ever went and visited her, I sat down in her room uh, right next to her, and all she did was started crying. You know why she was crying? Oh, not because she was sad. No, you know what she told me about? When she got saved. First thing she told me when I got saved, let me tell you about it. Can I tell you what God did for me? Man, I left that place and I would have went into hell myself with a pistol and saying, let's go. And I walked back in to that room. And I just stood by her bedside. No tears. No mourning. But I'm looking at a dear saint that has lived her life for this moment. That has told all of her family about the moment that Jesus Christ transformed her life. As the next time that I went back to her house, not long later, to, to visit her again, and I prayed with her again. And you know what she told me that time? This time, it, it began to be something different. Not so much the transformation that happened in her life, but this is what she began to say. Would you pray for, and she started naming all family. Would you? They need the Lord. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. You know what her whole life was about? Serving Jesus. Her greatest joy in life was nothing that this world could ever say that I gave you or did for you. Her greatest joy was the moment she met Jesus Christ as her Lord. And, so, and she didn't look back. Hard times, tough times, struggles. She never looked back. You know why? Because she was seeking Jesus constantly throughout her life. Seek him this morning. The things... That God wants us to do. In verse 6. Look at the very first part. It just says this. Seek the Lord and live. 
The whole aspect is this. I can't go back to Summersville and repeat that process and try to get me a good emotional feeling. It won't happen. I can't go back over to Greensburg, to that old park, to under the pavilion, to the exact same. Listen to me. I could try to recreate the whole moment, but the aspect of it is this. You can't go back. Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes the reason you can't go back, now let's draw this in. Sometimes the reason you can't go back is because that place is defiled. And you just don't need to be there. God may have did a transforming work, but all of a sudden man's sin had crept in in that place. And what God is saying is, don't you go back over there. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh. I changed your life and transformed you there, but don't keep going back to it. You don't need to go back there. That's not the place that I want you at. I I want you to seek me and live. Jesus this morning is saying this to you. In this church, listen, there is nothing that David can do to come up and play a song that we would say, man, the glory fell. And so what we want David to do, we want you to put back on your tie and your shirt the exact same color. And we want you to come up here. And Dustin, we want you to get your guitar, right? And we want you to set the exact same way and make sure everything you hold. Hold your hand just right because you can't tilt your, you can't stick out your tongue. Everything's got to be exactly the same because what we want to do, we want to recreate a moment when God fell. And God is saying, stop it. Stop it! Quit trying to recreate the moments when God fell. Remember them absolutely. There's no way they would have forgot these names. God did amazing things there. But what he is saying this morning is this. Quit trying to get back. Because guess where you're sitting at right now? You're probably not sitting in the exact same place where Jesus transformed your life. Quit trying to get back to that place. God wants to do something today. He he wants your life. See, some of you all, I'm just wondering, how long has it been? How long's it been? How long's it been since truly you felt the power of God in your life? Now listen to me. I'm not saying how long's it been since you felt the power of God move through this place because God's always moving through this place. His power is always here. The question I'm asking is this. When's the last time personally you felt the power of God in your life? If it's been a while, here's my solution for you. Quit Trying to recreate a moment in time and seek him right now. Because this is what God's wanting to do for you. He says, quit going back over there. Quit trying to get to that place. Quit trying to conjure up and remember that in your mind. Quit trying to have that same type of feeling. Listen to me. Can I tell you something? Christianity is not about emotion. Because if Christianity only dealt with emotion, man, people would be Christian one day and probably three weeks they wouldn't be a Christian. Because it's an emotional roller coaster sometimes. But it's not about emotion. It's about by faith believing what God has done in your life by the power of Jesus Christ that is transforming everything. You see, we live in a time right now where for some reason I just talked to, to someone this week. And you know what they said as I was talking to them on the phone? They had called to inquire about some things. And so I talked to them. And then all of a sudden they said this. It's what all pastors love to hear. I've been thinking about coming to y'all's church. And here was the response. He said, but i got to get my life straightened out first. (laughs) Now here's what your pastor told him. Now don't pass out. We're on the phone. And I said, well, that ain't ever going to (laughs) happen. I said, what you need to do, you need to get to church And bring all your junk with you. And then when you get here, you allow God to do a work in your life by the power of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. And then you won't have to worry about trying to get your life in order. God takes care of all that. But you see, for some reason, listen, 
For some reason, there are people in this community that feel they've got to look right or be right to be able to come to church here. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Do you care what they look like? Can I just ask you? Do you care what they look like? I sure don't. Hey, listen. If somebody comes in and they're dressed immodestly, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take care of that situation. Am I going to run them off and tell them never to come back? Well, you got another thing coming. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What we're going to do is we're going to teach them, and we're going to show the love to them. Now, listen, we're still going to hold true to the Word of God. We're going to make sure that they understand everything that's going on. By the way, I don't back off the Word of God. Not going to do it. I don't care what sin it is. I don't care what aspect it is. I don't back off of it. We're still going to hit it direct on. You know why? Because Jesus did. Do we have to be loving about it? Absolutely. But the aspect of it right now is in our society, inside the church, the church is trying to make us only love but never allow the Holy Spirit to convict. There's no transformation without the power of the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to someone's life. There is not a single person ever on the face of the earth that ever got saved without conviction that come to their life. It's the only way that you know that you're lost. If love was the only aspect, then Jesus didn't even have to die on the cross. If it was all about love, we didn't need that part. God could have just said, I love you, and that's good enough. Oh, but no. We had to truly have the conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit to say, hey, he died for your sins. Do you accept that? I, I just wonder, where are you at this morning? Are you still seeking something else other than the Lord? Because he's wanting to do some amazing things in your life. God this morning is saying this. Stop where you're at. Just right now. Just stop. Just take a break. Take a break in the aspect of where you are. And what he's saying is truly this. Seek me and live. Seek me. I'm the answer. Listen, I can preach every message that's known to man, but it don't do anything if you don't seek him. I can sit up here and read the Bible every Sunday, and I can start in Genesis and go all the way through the Revelation, but if you don't seek him, it does no good. I can't save you, and neither can anyone else on the face of the earth. But God says to seek me and live. You see, the aspect of it is this. Are you living in sin this morning? Stop where you're at. Seek him right now. Just seek him. Are you having trouble financially? Just stop where you're at. Just seek him. Just seek him and nothing else. Just seek him. You want God to fall another time in this place? Then stop where you're at. And this morning we just seek him. As David and Dustin, as they begin to play this morning, I just wonder, are you ready? I don't have any gimmicks for you this morning. I don't have an ulterior motive for the reason that I want you to be here. My desire is for you to be here so that you can grow closer to Jesus Christ. So that you can encourage your brothers and sisters. So that you can be a faithful witness to each and every person that you run into. That's the reason that I desire for you to be here. The reason I want to be here is because I myself, I want to draw closer to the Lord. Man, I long for God to speak through our messages, through our songs, through everything else, through Sunday school. I love when God begins to move. And what he's saying this morning is this. Seek me and live. Are you dying in your sins and your trespasses? Seek him. And you won't be dying anymore. You'll be living like never before. You see, God wants you how you are and where you're at this morning. You can't clean yourself up. You can't do anything that's going to make yourself look any better to God. God takes you as you are, and he begins to do a work in your life. And he begins to say, oh, now that looks a lot better. You accepted my son as Lord and Savior of your life. And he has forgiven you of your sins. Man, that looks good.
That's what God, but you know what begins to happen? God says now, here's the aspect of it. Man, I am so thankful for what happened to you at that altar. But now God begins to say, now there's something else I just need to deal with. Oh, you look good, but, but you can't change yourself, but my word does. And so I, I don't want you to look like this anymore. There's a different aspect to your life, how I want you to look. Would you seek me again? Would you seek me again? I want you to keep living. I, I don't want you to become stale. I don't want you to be stagnant. I, I don't want you to even think about going backwards. I want you to seek me and continue to live. You see, this morning, I'm afraid sometimes... We enjoy our encounter with Jesus Christ at the altar only one time. And then sometimes I wonder, do we truly seek him anymore? Our devotional time goes by the wayside. Our prayer time of one-on-one begins to be cut out. Truly saying, you know what, I I need to spend a little bit more time with the Lord because the only way I'm going to look like him is if I truly understand who he is. Where are we at this morning? You see, it's awesome to want to get the lost and dying into these doors. But if they come in and they see that we're exactly the same, they'll walk right back out and they won't want anything else that we've got. They've got to know that there's something different in our lives. And the only way for us this morning to be able to show them this something is if we seek him and we continue to live. And God is ever changing how we look don't try anything else don't seek anything else don't live for anything else just seek him and live would you stand this morning